All right, well, it's great to see you. This is uh, really a privilege and it's kind of a historic day. I never thought that I would be looking out at you with your masks on <laughs> when 2020 started. Uh, it's going to be different for sure, uh, but we get to gather as a church, and I am really, really thankful. We have missed you uh, so much, and uh, there's a lot that is not going to be quite what we want it to be today, obviously, uh, just because we want to be safe and we want to uh, follow all the regulations that the government gives us. and. Uh, that means there's a lot less of us here, and it means we can't sing. God is singing, I'm sure, but we can't sing. And uh, we can't really even hug or linger, but we can gather together and see each other's faces, and we can hear God's word, and we can remind each other that we love one another. We love God and we love one another. And so I am, and I'm sure you are, just going to be grateful for today. It's great to see Abby Kappel here even celebrate her birthday. Glad you're here. I'm hoping uh, in the future that uh, we can get some more of you involved in the service. And uh, if we can't do some other things, I was thinking we can do some new things and we can do some more praying and I would like it if uh, some of you might be able to share even a testimony. And we're allowed to have people sing solo, so I'm so glad we do have someone who's going to sing today, but would love it if some of you would be willing to sing, if you can think about it just like singing for Jesus and your family. And uh, maybe you can let me know. I don't know who can sing. If someone asked me to sing, I would definitely say no, and you are, you are thankful for that. But if you are willing to sing, let me know and we can talk about what song. And so I'd really, really love it if you're a member here and you have an idea of how you can get involved in some of those ways that uh, you would please let me know. Also want to say thanks to Blake, who's really worked hard, and the team uh, of deacons and others who have really worked hard to make sure that we can do this right today. Obviously, we have a lot going on on in our world uh, right now, and I know specifically I've been talking to some of you, and what's happened in the United States this past week has been uh, sensitive and, and, and definitely impacted you, uh, and I know that because some of you have told me, and uh, it's impacted me as well. I want you to know that. I hate to think of the many ways that people who are made in God's image and loved by God have been uh, ridiculed and minimized and abused by others and I think it's it's well I don't think I know <laughs> it grieves God and it should grieve us it's wrong and it should all cause us to take a step back and lament and I keep thinking what can we do as a church you know we're here where we're located, what can we do? And one thing we can definitely do is cry and pray and feel for others. To feel others' pain is doing something because we're all usually so self-centered. That's part of the problem that we don't notice what's going on in other people's lives. And so for us to feel is good and important. Another thing we can do, though, is just be the church. Uh, first of all, because Jesus is the only Savior for this whole world, and he needs to be proclaimed. We want to see this world changed in a fundamental way. But ultimately, the reality is we are not the ones who can save the world. And uh, only Jesus is going to be able to provide the fundamental changes that are needed. And we know he will. He will. He's going to reverse the curse and in the meantime, we need to proclaim that hope to the world. And we need to work hard at being a, a, a kind of demonstration to this world of a little taste of what it's going to be like when Jesus comes back. By the way that we actually love one another. We need to stand up for one another. We need to pray for one another. 
We need to sacrifice for one another. We need to listen to one another. We need to put up with one another. We need to be a place where if the world is wondering, can people get along and can races get along, they can look and see, okay, at least here is a little glimpse of hope. And honestly, you being here today with an American pastor is a demonstration of, of hope that we can, we're not just about race, we're about Christ, and we'll even listen to an American pastor if he's telling us the word, if he's exalting Christ. So you, what you're doing being here today, I think is a demonstration even of faith. And I want to be a demonstration of faith in Christ as well, and I really want us to be a community that is a showcase of God's supernatural love to the world. And of course, the only way we can become that kind of community is by looking to Jesus, by getting our eyes off of ourselves and on to God, which is what we want to do today. That is why we're here, to worship. And as we worship, that worship actually changes us. You become like what you worship. You become like who you worship. And so we want to worship the most holy, most merciful, most just, most compassionate God today. And I thought that I could call you to worship just by reading a scripture, and then we will stand, and we're going to call each other to worship through something called responsive reading. So if you're not ready to do some things that are a little different today, we're in trouble because we can't sing. So I've got some other things that are a little bit different that we're going to do even with our masks on. And uh, one thing we're going to do is something called responsive reading. And I'm just going to start by calling you to worship through Psalm 5-7. The psalmist says, But as for me, this is a commitment we're all sharing, as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship towards your holy temple. Is that true of you today? We're here because of God's mercy, and we want to worship him in awe. And so let's stand together and we'll read this. It's called Responsive Reading, so uh, Philip will go on to the next slide. And I'm going to say something, and then you're going to respond. It's not singing, but it is uh, something. So if you'll just stand with me. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Every day I will bless you, loving God and praising your name forever and ever. We worship the God who has conquered sin and death, who is raised to eternal life, and who claims each one as brothers and sisters with our Lord Jesus Christ. It's true, we are here to worship the God who has conquered sin and death for us and has given us eternal life and the message of eternal life and made us family, actual brothers and sisters. We're not just pretending. And so let me just pray and praise him for that. Almighty God, you sit on your throne. You rule over all. There is no one in heaven and no one on earth like you today. You are all powerful. You are all good. You are totally wise. You are merciful and compassionate. And you have done what you promised you would. We look back to the beginning of this world and we see that men rebelled against you and it ended up in brother, murdering brother, and they brought sin and death into this world. And on that very day that man sinned, you promised you would send a rescuer who would defeat Satan and who would reverse the curse. And you've done that. You've done that in a way that is bigger and better than we could ever imagine because you sent your very own Son into this world. The Son of God became man so that he could, as man, keep the promise you made way back at the beginning of this world because none of us could. Now, God, as we look back at what Jesus did on the cross, we know that is actually just the start of what Jesus plans to do. 
And so we ask, God, that you would fulfill all the promises you have made about what you would do through him. You said that your servant would not grow discouraged or disheartened until he brought justice into this land. And please, God, we ask, would you bring justice to the world? You said that he would establish your kingdom here on earth and that you would deal with all the pain and all the suffering that sin has brought. Please, God, establish your kingdom. We cry out as your people today, may your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we know in heaven that people love one another perfectly. We know in heaven there is no class system. We know in heaven that there is no one who is mistreated. We know in heaven that justice is done perfectly. God, we long for you to establish your kingdom on earth. We want to see your will done on earth the way it is in heaven. And God, we're going to seek to obey you. We're going to seek justice. We're going to seek to love our neighbor. But ultimately, God, we know that our hero, our Savior, has to come back and do what he promised he would. So Jesus, please come back. Please come back. We pray this in your name and for your glory. Amen. You can be seated. I want to read a psalm for you, and I thought this was an appropriate psalm for those of us who are grieving or struggling today. You might even make this a prayer of yours as you listen. And listen for something that really stands out to you. And uh, perhaps there's a phrase that really grabs hold of you. As a deer pants for flowing streams. This is Psalm 42. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? The world has been saying this a long time to God's people. Where is your God? And David was crying. But as he cried, this is what he remembered. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you. From the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Amen. That is God's word. There are times where we cry out, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning? As our enemies gather around us and say, where is your God? In those moments, we need to go to our God. We need to speak to ourselves, talk to ourselves, not just listen to our enemies. We need to talk to ourselves and remind ourselves of the character and promises of God and preach this, hope in God, hope in God. Besides praising and longing for God as a community, we also want to take a moment and remember our need for God's forgiveness. And so I want to do a responsive reading again as a kind of community confession. And then I'm going to give you a minute or two to silently confess your sins to God and remember your need for the gospel. And so this is different to do a community confession, but we are not just I, we are we. And so we are 
together expressing our need for God. And so I'm going to read the pastor part and you read the congregation part. Um, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. If you'd like to kneel, that's fine. It'd be a little hard to read, I suppose, if you do. Lord, hear our confession and cleanse us from our sin. Most holy and merciful Father, we acknowledge and confess before you our sinful nature, prone to evil and slothful in good, and all our shortcomings and offenses. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your way, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. But you, O oh Lord, have mercy on us. We are ashamed and sorry for all the ways we have displeased you. Teach us to hate our errors. Cleanse us from our secret faults and forgive our sins for the sake of your dear Son. And, O oh, most holy and loving Father, help us to live in your light and walk in your ways according to the commandments of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, take a moment. It's important for us to confess for so many reasons. But one thing that confession does, it reminds us of our need of Christ. And as we remember our need of Christ, then we're able to relate to others in a way that is compassionate and merciful. And so often we try to do religion without confession. And if we try to do religion without confession and repentance, we become proud and arrogant and use the gospel to oppress others. And so we need to remember that we need Jesus today. And so I'll just take, ask you to take a minute or two and even think back to your week. Think back to the ways in which you have broken God's law, the ways that you failed to love God with all your heart, the ways that you failed to love your neighbor as yourself, maybe the ways that you've thought. Last week, Andre talked about 80,000 thoughts we have a day, so that I'm sure there's a need for repentance in your thoughts when you think about the way God wants us to think, maybe the ways you've sinned in your words towards others, your desires. Take a moment and confess those sins to God. Bring them to God and repent. Well, let me encourage you now from God's Word. As we think about our sins, we need an encouragement. And here it is. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In fact, just to make sure you hear that, let's repeat that with me because that is a promise from God. If, so that's a pretty big if, so before we start, if, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness is God willing to cleanse us from? All unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, there is forgiveness for sinners in the cross of Christ. That is a promise. I can say to you, your sins are forgiven if you have repented of your sins and trusted in Christ, because God says to you, your sins are forgiven. He makes that promise here. If you confess your sins, he is faithful, he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. unrighteousness. That is good news, and that is a promise. Take that and grab it. And to encourage you with that promise, uh, Gino is going to come and sing a song for us, and we can't sing with her, unfortunately right now 
but we can think about the words. I suppose we can probably hum if you're a good hummer. And uh, you can sing, certainly with your mouth closed, you can sing in your heart. This is a song that we all know, and I hope your heart is bubbling over as she reminds us of the love of God. So, Gino, if you would come and sing. Yeah, uh, this is wonderful. Let me just uh, put it somewhere here. Uh, uh, please, can we uh, stand up, all of us? It's really a wonderful time again to, to be with the Lord. Uh, you can't imagine how I was looking forward to this time to, and how I was praying about it, that God would fortify everyone and come back more determined and more uh, actually attempt to serve God and uh, to be faithful to him. I was really praying this almost every day. So the song uh, Gino um, chose is The Love of God. This is her favorite song. And then all of us, we know it and we can sing together. Let's go. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever fail. It goes beyond the highest stars and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pain bowed down with care. God gave his son to win his erring child. He reconciled and pardoned from his sin. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forever more endure the sense and end. God song when years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall when men who him refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountain floor God love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong redeeming rest to Adam's rest the saints and angels song O oh, love of God how rich and pure how measureless and strong, it shall forever more endure the sense and angel song. Who dwell within the ocean field and where the skies of parchment made where every star. On earth a queen, and every man a scribe by thread. To write the love of the above, who drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky. To sky, O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever more endure the sense and angel song. God bless you. Thank you.
All right, thank you so much. Uh, so nice to kind of well, listen to singing and <laughs> be together. Maybe this will be the chance for our church to learn some uh, moving while we sing. Since we can't sing, at least our bodies can move. This might be the time our church changes that way. That would be huge, wouldn't it? If we actually, we can't sing, but we can sway. That would be, we'll come back stronger than ever before. There might be a, a, a real movement in our church. Well, uh, besides uh, listening to singing and confessing our sin uh, to Christ, one of the things that we can do together uh, that we can't do simply in our homes is confess the faith together. So uh, we, uh, in our homes, we can say with our families, this is what we believe. But there's something special about being able to gather together with a group, even if it's a smaller group, and say, no, this is what we believe. You know, you're on Facebook during the week and you've got people telling you what they believe all the time. And it, even for me, sometimes it just becomes like madness, right? But it's good to gather together with God's people and say, this is our rock. This is what we believe, even when we don't feel like we believe it. This is what we believe. And I'm not the only one who believes it. We believe it together. And so this is a little bit long. I, I, like I said, I'm making you work. You're not singing, but I'm making you work. We're going to confess this together. And uh, just as a, almost as like, hey, we're, we're, we're a family. And we're saying, this is what we believe as a, a family. And um, you can be seated as we read it. But let's read this as a testimony of our faith. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe God is working through the church. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. Amen. Well, there is a lot of truth, actually, in that creed, and I hope remembering what you believe encourages you to continue to believe it this week. Let's uh, pray, and we're going to ask God to bless us as we come to study his word. One of the greatest privileges I have in life is to share God's word with you, and that's what we want to do. And this is not just another lecture. One of the things that God does as his word is preached and as his gospel is preached, something supernatural happens. I'm not just talking about something that happened a long time ago. The Holy Spirit in the hearts of believers is able to help us see Christ. And that's what I want for you today. I want you to see how beautiful Jesus is. And so let's pray that God would enable us to hear him speak today. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and follow the way of your wisdom. We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life, and that we may feast on Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Aid your servant in bringing forth the word of God, that I might glorify you 
and aid your people to hear these words of life as they are the words of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, if you'll take uh, your Bible and open with me to the Gospel of Luke. It is a little weird, uh, not just to be sp speaking to a phone. I've done this for so many weeks now, just talking to a phone. It's nice to be speaking to actual people. I like it. It's a lot better, and I'm glad to see those of you who were able to come, and I want to say hello to those of you on Facebook who are watching with us and you're not able to make it. If you want to say hello as I'm preaching, that would be great. There's a, a lot going on right now, and I, I, I thought about saying some things about what's happening because it's so sad and we need help thinking through it, but we're in the Gospel of Luke, and I think we're here actually for a reason. I think God has us here for a reason, because we're coming to the cross, and I think it speaks better than I ever could to where we are at. And I know it's been a couple weeks now since we were in the Gospel of Luke, and I'm thankful to Andre for sharing uh, with us the past couple Sundays. It's really kind of God to give us such gifted young preachers, and we are grateful for the leaders he's given us in the church for sure. But we're back in Luke now. And I thought we might actually go back and look a little more carefully at Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. Luke 22, 39 through 46, which is Jesus praying on the Mount of Olives. And maybe it's been a little too long and you don't remember, but we did kind of look at this a couple of weeks ago and we saw that it's here, at least one purpose, to show us how we are supposed to respond to the difficulties that we face in this world. How are we supposed to live in the middle of this difficult world right now? I think it is connected to the story that goes before it, actually, where Jesus has told his followers, things are changing, and it's going to get super hard, and they need to prepare, you might say, for war. And this is how to prepare for war. They need to be a people of prayer. This is a big old call to pray. Pray, Jesus says, that you might not enter into temptation. And he actually says it twice to make it very clear. But you know, I couldn't go on. I started to go on in my studies because we looked at this, but then I went back. I couldn't go on. I didn't feel like it was right to go on without taking this opportunity to look a little more closely at Jesus. We always need to look at Jesus. We get in such a rush, at least I do, studying through my Bible, that sometimes we're in the danger of, faith, of missing Jesus. And we don't want to miss Jesus. We can't miss Jesus. Because the whole purpose of the Bible is to help us see and enjoy Jesus. And so today, I want us to look at Jesus praying on the Mount of Olives. And I want you to see how he's such a beautiful, powerful example of what it means to have faith. This is faith on display at the Mount of Olives, in the middle of a crisis, under pressure. Because you know we've been talking a lot lately about how to face times of crisis. And Donovan, you remember, talked about the importance of lamenting. And then even Andre talked about praying with thanksgiving and not being anxious and grabbing hold of your thoughts. And one of the things I love about the Bible is that God doesn't only tell us to do those things. He also shows us how to do those things. Because God became man, that's Jesus, and Jesus shows us how to respond to crisis in faith. Let me read it. Luke says, And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing... Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. 
And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, a little backstory quickly, just to help you understand why we're not just moving into the next section right away. I've been reading a lot of Puritans, and uh, for the most part, Puritans were these old godly people from a couple hundred years ago. I guess they weren't all old at the time, and probably they weren't all actually godly, but they are old now. And I've been reading the Puritans out loud because sometimes, honestly, their English is so hard even for me. But they have some amazing things to say. I want to know what they're saying. And in particular, I've been reading one old Puritan named Thomas Goodwin. And he's got a book called Christ Set Forth. And he starts that book by saying something that I had actually never really thought very much about before. He says that we know for the most part that Jesus is the object of our justifying faith. And you need to know that. Jesus is the object of justifying faith. And that just means, who are we putting our faith in so that we can be justified by God, declared right by God? We are putting our faith in Jesus. God the Father and Jesus are working together to justify us. But Jesus is specifically the object of our justifying faith. But then he goes on, and this is the part I hadn't thought very carefully about before. But he says, Jesus is not only the object of our justifying faith, he is also the example of justifying faith. We look to Jesus as the object of our faith, but we also look to Jesus as the example of our faith. In other words, if you're going to ask the question, what does it look like to trust God? You need to look to Jesus. And Goodwin is actually saying one step further, if you want to know what it means to trust God for justification, you need to look to Jesus. And man, if there's any place in the Bible that puts Jesus' faith so clearly on display, and I think his confidence that God would justify him, it's here as he's praying in the Mount of Olives. Now let me take some time to try to explain that. That's what I want to do. First, by showing you the pressure that Jesus was under. And second, the prayer that Jesus offered. I want you to see faith in action. By looking at the pressure Jesus was under and the prayer that Jesus offered. And pressure is not even really a a, a great word, honestly. If there's a word that's bigger to describe what's happening to Jesus, we should use the word that's bigger, because there is no one who suffered more than Jesus. And I know that's a big thing to say. And I can make it even bigger. There is no one who has suffered a greater injustice than Jesus. And that's big, I know, when you think about all the people who have suffered and experienced injustice. But I hope you're going to see why I can say that. But since there is no one who has suffered more than Jesus. There's no one who has faced a greater test of his faith than Jesus. And we see some of the pressures that would have made that test difficult coming together as he's praying here on the Mount of Olives. First of all, he's going to be betrayed, and he knows it. It hasn't happened yet fully, But Jesus knows it is going to happen. In fact, he's already told his disciples about it. And we're going to talk more about this one next week. But betrayal is really a unique kind of pain, isn't it? I mean, Jesus has been through a lot in his life already. Like he was born in a scandalous kind of way. At least it looked that way to others. He was poor. He lived as a refugee, as a young child. He spent 40 days being attacked by Satan. We can't even imagine that. He was rejected by his hometown. He was slandered and lied about 
and insulted over and over and over by the religious leaders just for doing the right thing. So even before we get to the Mount of Olives, Jesus has suffered in many different ways, but betrayal is really its own kind of pain, isn't it? And I know obviously when someone else is betrayed, we're sometimes like, get over it. (laughs) But when you're betrayed, it's different. And the more you love someone, the more that betrayal hurts. If you're just kind of a selfish person, living your own life, betrayal is not so bad, I guess. But if you love someone, it's different. And there's no one who loved others like Jesus. So knowing one of his disciples is going to betray him is a very real kind of suffering. And we know that Jesus felt that. We actually know that Jesus felt that. Because way back in the Psalms, The writer of the psalm speaks for Jesus. So there are these psalms where the writer is actually prophesying, and he's putting words in Jesus' mouth, and he's describing what is going on in Jesus' heart. And when they talk about Jesus' suffering in the psalms, they often bring up the fact of his betrayal. Like, listen to Psalm 41.9. They say a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. And that's talking about Jesus' enemies. But look at this. Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. And you can hear that. Even my close friend. It's like twisting the knife. Psalm 55, 12 is maybe more explicit. Jesus says, It's not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It's not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it's you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house as we walked in the throne. So there's betrayal. That's one pressure Jesus is facing that would have made this a test of faith. When people you think you can count on betray you. But there's more. Second, there's the confusion of his friends as well. It's really hard to go through trials alone. A trial is is one thing. Going through it alone is another. And you know, you can have your friends around you and still be lonely, especially if they don't understand you. It's almost worse. They're there with you, but they don't understand you. And even though all the disciples are here with Jesus as he prays on the Mount of Olives, they definitely are not understanding him at this point. I can say for me, one big trial is when you're really pouring out your heart to someone and you want to help them understand something important and they can't seem to get it. Especially when you know they're going to suffer for not understanding And Jesus knows what's going to happen to the disciples after this and he knows They're not getting that. Even we can see that. Every time after Jesus starts talking about dying and being crucified, what do they start talking about? Which one of them is the greatest? Every time. And we saw that Jesus has told us Satan is going to sift them like wheat. And they're not understanding. And they're going through a trial. And yet when he's told Simon about that, Simon's like, you don't have to worry. I've I've got this. And that's got to be a big pressure on Jesus' heart. We see Paul, and he's not Jesus, but when Paul talks about his sufferings, it's not the physical sufferings that really were the hardest for him. When he comes to the climax of describing his sufferings, he says the greatest suffering that he faces is the daily pressure on him of his anxiety for all the churches. Who's weak and I'm not weak? Who's made to fall and I don't become indignant? And again, that's Paul, not Jesus, but if Paul felt that, Jesus felt that, even more intensely as he was looking at these disciples. There's betrayal, there is confusion, that's pressure on him, but honestly, that's not even really the beginning. That's not even really the beginning. Thirdly, the the primary pressure on Jesus right now, the ultimate cause of his anguish, is the fact that he is going to endure the wrath of God. And I want you to get a feel for how much faith Jesus is exercising here on the Mount of Olives. I want you to get a sense of that. 
And to get a sense of that, you have to appreciate the pressure that he's under. And to appreciate the pressure that he's under, you might think about being betrayed. You might think about being alone. But fundamentally, you have to think about what it meant for Jesus to have to endure the wrath of God. Have you ever thought about that? What it meant for Jesus to have to endure the wrath of God. This is the issue. And how can we get our, how can we get our minds around this? We can't get our minds around this, but in faith we can try. To start, look at the first part of Jesus' prayer. Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. And it's the word cup that I want you to focus on. This cup. Because what does Jesus mean? What's he asking? It's a metaphor, cup, obviously. He's not talking about an actual literal cup in his hands. And it refers not so much to the cup itself, but what's in the cup. Even you, if you say, get this plate away from me, you don't mean the plate itself, you mean what's on the plate. And what's in the cup that Jesus is talking about? Generally, we assume that he's talking about his suffering. And there's truth to that. For example, in Matthew 20, he uses it that way. He's talking to the mom of James and John. After he talked about being crucified, James and John went and got their mom to ask Jesus which one of them was going to be the greatest. And Jesus asks them, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And they say, yeah, we're able. That doesn't seem that difficult. And Jesus said to them, you will drink my cup. And I think Jesus is actually just talking generally about his sufferings and his sorrows and his persecutions that he's about to go through. So you might just take the physical suffering that Jesus is about to endure on the cross. When you think about this, Jesus knew he was going to die as he was praying in the garden. And what's more, he knew exactly how he was going to die. And he had literally known this for years. Luke 9, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And in other places, he gets more specific and he actually talks about being mocked, flogged, and crucified all before it happens. Looking forward to suffering is a kind of suffering. I remember when Marta had cancer and she had to go through chemotherapy. Part of the suffering was getting ready for the suffering. <laughs> so the process with chemotherapy is you, you have to take this medicine and you feel like you're going to die. They basically have to almost kill you. <laughs> and so this medicine is killing you from the inside out. And then slowly but surely, after about two weeks, you start to feel a little bit better. And just when you're about to feel better, you're almost alive again. It's time to go back and take some more of that medicine. And part of what makes it so hard is knowing that it's coming. You're feeling better, but you know you're going tomorrow for more chemotherapy, and it's going to be death all over again. And so there's no question that in the garden, part of the pressure on Jesus is anticipating this physical pain that's coming. As one theologian writes, Christ's death on the cross was preeminently painful. It appears to have been devised by a savage genius to cause as much suffering as possible. Hence, the vital parts are left untouched. The wounds are inflicted upon the extremities of the body, iron spikes being driven through the hands and the feet, while the poor sufferer has to hang in a position which does not allow him any comfort or rest. And a burning inflammation works its way gradually to the source of his life. It was a death painful in the extreme, so much so that the strongest term we have for expressing intense agony, the term excruciating, comes from it. You ever heard the English word excruciating? Where does that word come from? That's the strongest English word for pain, and it comes from crucify. We've all seen just a graphic, terrible image of a person in the position of authority killing someone this week. And this is what's happening to Jesus as he hangs on the cross with nails through his wrists, gasping for breath. But here is the key. 
The outward sufferings which Jesus bore on the cross were nothing. Say it with me. Were nothing. Nothing. When compared with his inward sufferings. His bodily agonies, as great as they were, were as light as a feather in comparison with the agonies of his soul. The sufferings of his soul were truly the soul of his sufferings. Because I think this word cup refers more specifically to the judgment of God for sin. When Jesus talks about the cup, he's talking about the judgment that God is going to pour out on him for our sin. You have to understand what's happening on the cross to understand this prayer. Jesus says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. And what's in the cup? It's all his sufferings, of course, physical suffering included. But the word cup is an Old Testament word that describes God's judgment, God's wrath and punishment for sin. See if you can hear it. Listen to Psalm 11.6. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. What's in that cup? Fire, sulfur, and a scorching wind from God. Judgment on the wicked. Psalm 75, 8, and I'll just give you two so you get the point. For in the hand of the Lord there's a cup with foaming wine well mixed, And he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drink it down to the last drop. And the psalmist is talking there about God's day of judgment, and this verse is sort of a climax. It's God who executes judgment, for in the hand of the Lord is a cup that he's going to pour out on the wicked. And so when Jesus asks God to remove the cup, he's talking about the fact that he's going to have to endure the wrath of God for all the sins that you and I have committed as believers. Jesus didn't go to the cross because he did anything wrong. And he didn't go to the cross simply because the Jews got upset with him and wanted to get rid of him. He went to the cross as part of God's plan to pay the penalty for the sins that we committed by being punished in our place. So let me explain this a little more thoroughly. If you'll stick with me, you're going to be worshiping if you're a Christian by the end. We've all sinned. And we're all going to stand before God as judge. God's holy, and he requires that every single sin that has ever been committed be punished. Which is a problem for us, because the punishment of sin is death, eternal death. And so how can any of us be declared right by God? God came up with this plan, a plan that only God could come up with. God the Son became man to take the punishment for man's sin. Man had to pay for what man did. But man can't pay for what man did. So God comes up with a plan and becomes man to take the punishment for what man did. That is what's happening on the cross. And you have to think a little bit about what it must have been like for Jesus to anticipate that. Have you ever thought about that? One man's sin deserves hell, right? One man's sin deserves hell. But Jesus isn't just taking one man's sin. Let me say that again so you can stick with me. One man's sin deserves hell. But Jesus isn't just taking one man's sin. He's taking the sins of hundreds and thousands and maybe even millions of men and women who would put their trust in him. And he's going to receive the full punishment of God on the cross for that. That's hard for us to even comprehend. Remember, Jesus is living his life fully as a man. This is important. He's God, yes, but he's laid aside the independent use of his attributes. And that's big theological words, I know, but for now, just to understand, he's really a man as he's in the garden. And he's looking forward to crucifixion and being judged by God for the sins of hundreds and thousands and millions of people. And so imagine the kind of faith that he's having to exercise right now. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
Obviously, he's perfect, and so he doesn't have to be concerned, would God accept me because of the life I lived? Because of course God would accept Jesus for the life he lived. The life he lived was perfectly righteous, but he was going to the cross in your place. He was going to be taking your sins upon himself. And as he's anticipating the wrath of God for your sin coming upon him, he had to exercise his faith. He had to trust that God the Father would justify him, accept his sacrifice, take off all those sins and his wrath off of him and be satisfied so that Jesus would be declared not guilty. And here's the thing, he's not having to exercise that faith just for himself. He's having to exercise that faith for all of us. And the kind of faith that he's having to exercise for us is much greater than the, any kind of faith that we have to exercise for ourselves alone. Because he's got thousands and thousands and thousands of sinners that he's having to trust God will be able to save through what he's doing on the cross. You just have to trust that God can save you through what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus had to trust that God could save thousands and thousands and millions of sinners through what he did on the cross. I mean, it's hard for me sometimes to think, is Jesus' death really enough to satisfy God for my sins? But Jesus is having to trust God that his death would be enough not just to satisfy God for my sins, but for your sins and your sins and your sins and your sins and the sins of every other believer. Let me quote Thomas Goodwin, and it's so sweet. I know it might be a little challenging, but there's encouragement here. There's gold here if you work at it. He says, Neither did Jesus exercise faith for himself only, but for us also. And that more than any of us has to, to exercise for ourselves. For he, in dying and emptying himself, trusted God with the merit of all his sufferings beforehand, there being thousands of souls to be saved a long while after, even to the end of the world. Are you hearing this? As you look at Jesus in the garden, what is he having to believe God for? What, what pressures is he facing? He's going to the cross, and he knows he's going there to pay the price for man's sin. And he's having to trust that God will accept his sacrifice, and that once he's accepted his sacrifice, he will take and apply what he did to all these thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are going to believe him after his death. And I know maybe this is a little challenging if you haven't thought of this before, but I'm wanting you to understand the pressure Jesus is under. Luke describes Jesus as being in agony. When Mark tells the story, he's a little more specific. Apparently, Jesus had left all his disciples at one spot, then he took three a little further. And when he did that, Mark says he began to become greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is sorrowful even to death. And people who know Greek say one of the words Jesus uses there describes a sudden and horrifying shock. The word is used to describe someone who's feeling helpless, disorientated, who's agitated, anguished by the threat of some approaching event. And there's even a really strong tradition that says as Jesus was praying in the garden, he was in such agony that his sweat became like great drops of blood. And it's there in Luke 22, verse 44, but I say tradition because most of the oldest copies of Luke didn't have that verse in there, but still, it was put in there a little later for a reason, and the reason's probably because it was such a strong tradition, like this is something that everybody knew happened. And you have to wonder, why was Jesus in such agony? Why is Jesus sweating like great drops of blood? It's not so much for the physical pain itself. I think this is... Because he knows he's going to have to endure the wrath of God. And his faith is being tested. And look at how he responds. I want you to see my whole goal is to help you see faith in action, to help you learn what it looks like to trust God by looking at Jesus here in this garden. And to do that, first you have to understand the pressure Jesus is under, anticipating the wrath of God for his sins. And not, not for his sins, no, please, no, not for his sins, for our sins. 
for our sins and the sins of all of us. And second, you have to look at the prayer Jesus offered. First of all, there's just the fact that he does pray. That's an example of faith, right? When you are about to be betrayed and you feel alone and you think about God's holiness and justice, what do you do then? One of the ways you demonstrate faith in God is by going to God in prayer. We're good at expressing how upset we are on Facebook or to others in conversation, but are we actually on our knees in prayer? And then I think there's also just the fact that he's caring about his disciples. Jesus is about to go to the cross, and yet earlier in verse 32, who did he say he was praying for? He said he was praying for the disciples. And even here, as he goes to the Mount of Olives to pray, verse 40, he's encouraging the disciples, and he still has his eye on teaching them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. What does it look like to trust God in the face of tremendous pressure, in the face of a crisis? You go to God in prayer, and you don't get so wrapped up in yourself that you forget all the people around you. You look out for their spiritual good, even as you're agonizing, you, and you're praying, you're concerned about how all of this is impacting them. These are kinds of tests you can use to evaluate yourself, I suppose, because it's easy to say you trust God. But do you trust God? Are you eagerly engaging God in prayer? Are you praying for others? Are you still noticing and caring about the spiritual needs of others? And then there's just the content of Jesus' prayer, and it's really short, but there's a lot for us to learn about what faith looks like. First, he's honest about what he wants. Verse 42, what does Jesus say? Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. And the fact that Jesus even asks this is really, really something. <laughs> there's such a great mystery to enjoy as you consider the gospel, because Jesus came for this. Jesus came for this. This is actually part of the plan that God the Father and God the Son made before the foundation of the world. He's been telling his disciples it had to happen. It's written in the scripture. And there's a sense in which Jesus even wanted this. Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, he went to the cross. In another place, he says, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down myself. But at the same time, Jesus is also a real man. And so it's challenging for us to hear Jesus say this. And some have tried to change the meaning, actually, that he's not really asking for the cup to be removed in terms of, I don't want to endure your wrath, but when I take your wrath, then please remove it. And then even some have said, this is an evidence of weakness on Jesus' part, like he's faltering here or something. But I think he's actually asking God to remove the cup because I can't get past the word nevertheless in the middle. <laughs> Not, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. There's a contrast. Jesus is saying, this is what I'm desiring right now as a human. But I don't think Jesus wanting that is weakness at all, the opposite, because what would you expect him to want? In fa fact, I think what Jesus is doing is exactly what you would expect an absolutely holy man who absolutely loves God with absolutely every single part of his being to do when he thinks about all of our sin being placed upon him. As a man, he's just expressing to God the pain in his heart, saying, God, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup, because he hates sin, Jesus. He hates it, and he loves God the Father more than anything. And so this is just an honest expression of pain, which is not a problem for people who have faith. I think we sometimes have the wrong idea of faith. What does faith look like? Does it mean you're not ever allowed to honestly express your pain to God in prayer? Faith, does it mean you're not allowed to experience real deep and pain and agony and confusion? No, faith doesn't mean that. Faith does mean, faith does not mean you don't suffer. Faith does not mean you don't talk about what you want in the middle of that suffering to God. But as you talk to God, faith does mean... Look at the two things Jesus says. This is so important because this is where we see faith in action because a lot of people will express their pain to God. That's not the difference between faith and not faith, but here's the difference. First, Jesus says, Father. Mark adds, actually, Abba, Father, Papa, 
which is an expression of relationship. And so think about this. Jesus is in agony. He's being betrayed. He's alone. He's about to die. He's about to face the wrath of God. He's kneeling down. At a certain point, he actually falls on his face. And Hebrews says he's praying with loud cries and tears. But he's praying what? Papa, 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 Father, Father, Father. In other words, he's not forgetting all these other truths as he's expressing his desire to God. You see, sometimes what people do when they're suffering, and this is lack of faith, is they throw out all the other truths they know to be true about God, and they only focus on their pain and their suffering. And so it's like they start attacking God instead of asking God. Ravi Zacharias, he's a defender of the faith. He says a lot of times people say, you know, if God is all-powerful and God's totally good and there's suffering in the world, how's that possible? Like that's an attack on God and they kind of think that's the end of the, that's the end of the, you know, uh, conversation. And he says, but that's not all God is. You're forgetting a lot of other truths about God, like the fact that he's eternal and he's wise and he's actually God. And what faith does, faith reminds you who God is and what he's done through Christ as you pray. So as you honestly express your pain and your desires and maybe even your questions, you do that remembering the promises of God and the character of God. Father, Papa, Papa, Papa. Second, Jesus says, Father. Then second, Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. There's trust, Father, and then there's submission. Because what Jesus wants more than what he wants as a man at that moment is what God the Father wants. That's faith. You get to the point in your life where you submit yourself to the sovereignty of God, even over your own desires. R.C. Sproul said, he says, it's the highest expression of faith to submit yourself to the sovereignty of God. The real prayer of faith is the prayer that trusts God, no matter whether the answer is yes or no. It takes no faith to claim like a robber something that is not ours to claim. We are to come to God and tell him what we want, but we must trust him to give the answer that is best for us, which is exactly what Jesus did. What does faith look like under pressure in the middle of a crisis? There's none of us who've experienced the kind of pressure that Jesus faced here. No one of you has suffered like Jesus has suffered. No one of you has experienced greater injustice than Jesus. What does it look like to have faith? What does Jesus do? He goes to God in prayer. He's concerned about the spiritual good of others. He honestly expresses his pain and his desires to God. He feels, and he feels deeply. But as he feels, he remembers truth. He remembers the character of God, and he submits himself to the will of God. And you know what? He gets up, and he moves out in full obedience to the word of God, which is maybe the best proof of faith of them all. He gets up after he prays, and he goes to the cross. Why? Because he trusted God. He trusted the word of God. He trusted that God would do what he said he would do, and that what God would do was the absolute best thing to do. How about you? I'm asking you now, how about you? Because I'm wanting this look at Christ to teach you and challenge you to exercise your faith in God. Generally, of course, as you face pressure, are you praying? Are you looking out for the needs of others? Are you honestly expressing your pain and desires? Are you remembering God's character and promises? Are you submitting yourself to God's will? Are you moving out in obedience to God? But even more specifically, as you think about facing God standing before the judge of the universe, and maybe you've never thought about this, but you should. Because you are going to stand before God. You are. And you're a sinner. And you're an even greater sinner than you think you are. What 
does it look like to believe that God is going to forgive you and accept you? How can you believe that? Think about Jesus in the garden. Jesus is anticipating he is going to be made the greatest sinner that ever was. He's anticipating that he is going to be made the greatest sinner that ever was. Not by his own sins, but by God taking all of our sins and placing them on him. And what did he do? He prayed, he cried out, he trusted God that he would be justified of them all because from here we know he went to the cross. If Christ trusted God to accept his sacrifice for the sins of the whole world back there in the garden, you need to trust God to accept his sacrifice for your sins now. Will you trust God? Ask the Spirit to help you look to Jesus, not only as the object of your faith, but as the example of what it means to have faith. And learn from him now. You say, but he's Jesus. Of course he knew God the Father was going to accept his sacrifice and vindicate him. But look at this. His Father loved him. Follow me now. God the Father couldn't love the Son more. But what happens here? Follow this. The Son prays in agony as a human. If possible, remove this cup from me. But not my will, but your will be done. And what happens? What happens? Is the cup removed? Is the cup removed? God the Father pours out his wrath on our sins, on his own son, which means what for you? It means it's God's will. Will God the Father accept Jesus' sacrifice for your sins? He willed. He willed. So he will. Believe him. Jesus did. You must you must as well. Let's pray. Father, I know you want believers to enjoy the gospel. This gospel is the power of God for salvation. It is beautiful, it is mysterious, it is profound. It is so enlivening. And I ask, Spirit of God, would you take this message that was preached and please, Lord, show Jesus to your people. Help them in faith to see Jesus, to learn from him what it means to have faith, to walk in his footsteps, and to enjoy the fact that if Jesus knew you would justify him for our sins, we should honor you now by believing that you accepted that sacrifice. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for gathering together with God's people today. And I uh, just ask that you will take this uh, message home. And if it was hard for you to understand, pray to God that he'll help you understand it better. Because there's joy and there's glory here in this gospel. And there's, get off of Facebook and all the noise and take some time and ask God to help you see Jesus. Because it's only if we see Jesus that we're going to know how to live in this world. Well, let me just close by giving a benediction. And this is my prayer for you. The Lord bless you and keep you, church. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance, countenance upon you and give you peace. Moses says, so they shall put my name on the children of Israel. And we could say, Jesus puts God's name on us. And God will 
bless you. God will bless you. Bless you, church. I wish we could stay and linger and hug, but let's WhatsApp and Facebook smiley face huggy to each other. And uh, love you and God bless you.